This is the story of the man who created India's first crime show. Every week he was on television screens around the nation narrating the exploits of the most devious criminals of the time. Until January 10th, 2000, when he found himself at the center of a criminal investigation. The difference was he was no longer researching or hosting this case, but instead living it. In the eyes of the police, the man that covers murder for a living had just covered up the murder of his own wife. This is the story of how the host of India's Most Wanted became one of the most wanted men in India. This is the story of Suhaib Ilyasi. everyone welcome to desi crime a show where we tell you some of the craziest stories from around south asia i'm your host aryan and i'm ashwara and the story i have for you today is one that is related to a man that did for a living ashwara very similar to what we do for a living tell crime stories which sounds like every true crime podcaster's nightmare Worst come nightmare. true to be actually embroiled in a case exactly. that you're covering yeah that's terrifying but also a man i've never heard of as a true crime yeah, podcaster yeah i know No idea what the story is. So I'll let Aran take us back to January of 2000 and tell us what the story is. It was a cold winter's day in Delhi. The new year had brought with it a new century and newfound hope. The 2000s had arrived. TV was booming in India, and one of the figures who carved a slice for himself in this trend was a young man named Suhaib Ilyasi. On that day, Suhaib was at his office in Kasturba Gandhi Marg, Delhi. The office was in the house that belonged to his parents but presently he was also using it as his office. This residence was named Big City. He had been working since the morning chipping away at the day's tasks. After all the man was responsible for creating India's biggest crime show, India's Most Wanted. India's Most Wanted. India fights back. You see in 1999 Suhaib began hosting a television crime show that graced the screens of millions of television sets around the country. Delhi ke hamare studios mein aap sabhi hazrat ka khair maqdam karta hai. I am Suhaib Liasi your host. A very warm good evening to you. Suhaib was a star in his own right, loved by the masses and on the rise in the media landscape. But fame is a double-edged sword. Suhaib had many fans, but soon he realized that some were more than just fans. They were fanatics. Take the case of a man named Z. Z was an ardent follower of Suhaib's show India Most Wanted. A few months ago, this fan had taken Suhaib and his daughter Alia to the Gurudwara and brought the syndicated host a locket, a symbol of his affection for the rising star. When Suhaib's wife Anju Ilyasi found out about this interaction, she was distraught. She didn't like Suhaib interacting with strangers, let alone bringing their daughter into such encounters. Completely justified reaction, yeah. I think, on Anju's part, but also, I think our listeners need to step it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we need a. We need a stronger fan base. A, Come on, you guys! Yeah, we need. Like, we need lockets. Where and are the lockets? Before Ishwara the- makes this comment, because she doesn't know what's about to happen. Don't be too crazy, as you'll just find out. Stay crazy, but like stay desi also. Not too crazy. <laughs> And Ashwara is right. Anju was justified, so she demanded Suhaib return the locket, and Suhaib promptly complied to his wife. A few days later, though, a parcel arrived at B13 IFS apartment, the Ilyasi's newly purchased home in Delhi's Mayur Vihar. The fresh paint scent enveloped the house, and Anju was still working on finishing up the interior decor. When Suhail opened this package, Anju's worst fears were confirmed. The parcel contained the same locket Suhail had returned to Z, except that it was soaked in Z's own blood. I take it all back. Yeah, yeah. I don't want. We're fine. We with love your you love. guys. You guys, but I best. don't want. We don't want your blood. Be safe. <laughs> 
The landline then rang and it was Z's wife on the other line. She told them that Z had stopped eating or going to work. Anju rightfully demanded Suhaib sever any ties to the psychotic fan and cease all communication. The family was unprepared for Suhaib's fame. The public persona brought tangible risks, which is why Suhaib had been provided police protection at all times. On 10th January of 2000, the cops escorting him were Head Constable Shatrugan and Personal Security Officer Raj Kumar. After working the entire morning, Suhaib dozed off between 4 and 8.30 pm. When he awoke, his secretary informed that Anju Madam, his wife, wants to speak to him. Suhaib tried calling his wife several times, but no one answered the phone. But eventually the line connected. Except it wasn't Anju. It was their driver, Sundar. The driver said that he's bringing over Alia, their daughter, to the office on Anju Madam's instructions. Suhaib was puzzled. He told his driver to let Alia be home since he will be returning shortly anyway. Suhaib carried on the day's work with his staff to look at properties in East Kailash for his production company called Alia Productions, named after his doting daughter. But again, Suhaib receives a call, this time from his wife. Anju tells him that she called Z, the crazy fan, to tell him he had won and she had lost. Quote, you win, I lose. What the hell was Anju talking about, Suhaib wondered. What do you mean you lost and he won? She said she'd only explain in person when he's back home. You see, Z had become a contentious topic in the couple's relationship. Despite Anju wanting a full stop to this drama, Suhail ended up accepting a gift of four bottles of alcohol as a gift on Eid. He had hidden this from Anju, explaining that he himself had purchased the liquor from Palika Bazaar. Ever since she found out the truth, she was mad for being lied to. But that still didn't explain you win, I lose. Suhaib was worried. Something felt off. Everything had been fine until that point. In fact, better than fine. The couple was planning a grand party at their new house for Anju's 30th birthday on January 16th, just six days away. And all of a sudden, from left field, Anju begins acting ominously. He hurried back to the office to collect his belongings before heading home. Awaiting him was Constable Shatrugan and, surprisingly, his daughter, Alia. Sundar, the driver, apologised for disobeying his boss, but explained that Anju Madam insisted I bring Alia to the big city residence. Something was fishy. When he went up to get his stuff, his typist informed him that Anju had called to relay a message. The message was that Suhaib had forgotten his revolver at home. Now, Suhaib felt that this was some kind of a veiled threat against him. Firstly, incredibly sus message to leave your husband, considering he has a security detail. Like, I get he has these threats and stuff. So I can imagine being the kind of wife to call and say, it's unsafe for you to come back. Like, I'm scared because you forgot your revolver at home. He has a security detail. Secondly, for Suhaib to assume that was a threat of some kind, like, where did he join those dots? Because Suhaib didn't carry his gun on person anyway. This wasn't a detail that was out of the regular. So when she made that, he worried that she is going to do something with the gun to somebody or to herself. Also keep in mind, she's she's been saying Alia needs to be out of the house. Alia needs to be out of the house. All of those things coming together going, why did she tell my typist my gun's at home? Because it's almost always at home. I'm kind of scared. Suhaib, Alia, Constable Shatrugan and Constable Raj Kumar get into the Honda City at 9.30pm and rush to their home in Mayur Vihar. Constable Shatrugan knew Suhaib since he had been his personal security detail for a while now. Couples fight, especially this couple, so he didn't think too much of it. January 10th, 2000 was supposed to be just another day on the job for him. But it was far from that. Up until that day, it was cool to be the bodyguard of the man that covered the most infamous criminals. But that night, his boss was about to embroil all of them in an infamous crime that would be covered by crime shows in 2024. Constable Shatrugan sat outside house number B13. He recalls Anju unexpectedly coming outside for 10 or 15 minutes and then going back inside. But he didn't think too much of that. At 10.30 p.m., two men showed up at the residence, Fazlu Rahman and Amiruddin. These were Suhaib's personal barbers. He had an early shoot slated for the next day and wanted to get a haircut for the same. Shatrukan checked the bags and let the boys in. One might justifiably wonder, isn't 10.30 in the night too late for a haircut, let alone allowing two men inside your house? 
but the visit didn't last long. They were back out in five minutes. The cop knew that was too short for a haircut for anyone, let alone a television star. The barbers explained that they had been dismissed and told to come later. Quote, Suheb sir gave me a cloth bed sheet and I just started cutting his hair. I had just started cutting when his wife came there and they talked with each other in English and thereafter went inside the room. After two minutes, Suheb came outside and told me to go and asked me to come tomorrow to his studio in Noida. Then Amiruddin and I left his house. End quote. Another 15 minutes passed by and it is almost 11 p.m. now, time for Constable to go to sleep. He used to spend the night at the Ilyasi household itself. It was getting late, but finally Suheb opened the main door to give Constable Shatrugan his bedding and blanket for the night. Or so he thought. Suheb panickingly flung the front door open. The constable could hear cries coming from inside. It was young Alia in tears. But then he spotted the source of their anguish. It was Anju. She was lying on the floor in her blue jeans and blue top, but around her abdominal area, the fabric had turned red. In shock, Shatrugan asked Suheb what happened. Quote, Anju stabbed herself with a kitchen knife. End quote. The grief-stricken husband said. To me, stabbing yourself is in general a really weird way of dying. Yeah. I just, I can't, like the aerodynamics of it, <laughs> not the right word at all. But I just can't figure it out. Secondly, stabbing yourself in the abdomen, I don't know. It's just, it all kind of seems fishy to me. It's so, it's so funny. You have gotten to the centerpiece of this investigation before the investigation has even begun. And... This is this is something the the forensics team is going to spend years finding out. So we'll get to it. All right. Constable Shatrugan scrambled to find an old vest, a banyan, to help stop the profuse bleeding. They carried Anju's half-conscious body to the car and drove to the Virmani nursing home in Mayur Vihar Phase 2. It's worth noting that this was probably the nearest medical facility, but at the same time, it wasn't a hospital. It was a nursing home. They hurried inside where Dr. R.K. Dikshit was on duty. Suheb demanded to see their head, Dr. Virmani, but he was unavailable. At 11.30pm, Dr. Dikshit conducted an assessment. He asked Suheb what happened. Now, here's where the plot thickens. Suheb says, quote, she ate something. Upon inspecting the white cloth tied around her abdomen, the doctor noted two punctures that evidently looked like stab marks. To this, Suheb said, quote, Something sharp hurt her. Sure, something sharp did hurt her. A kitchen knife. But when it's a life or death situation and the doctor is asking you what happened, it's not the time to get abstract and describe the properties of objects. Exactitude and precision helps diagnose and help the patient. Something Suheb knew all too well from his day job of describing the intricate details of crimes. Perhaps he was ashamed and didn't want to share the details to protect the family image. If stabbed once to try and kill yourself is weird, stabbed twice to try and kill yourself is like a bajillion times weirder. Yeah. So not believing his story at all. Hmm. With how stupid this sounds, he's better off just hiding the body hmm. than trying to create this whole story. So if you dive into medical literature, mm -hmm. it's, it's so weird and it's something I realized in investigating this case. Two stab wounds tend to be the norm for suicide by uh, by stabbing because the first cut is called a hesitational cut. Usually the oh, patient you're not, isn't mm. not sure of how much strength is involved. And I, again, I'll get to all these details. It's you, sure. you jump. You, it's like you know this case, Sorry. but I know you Sorry. don't know this case. Yeah. You should have been on the forensics team. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, two cuts are normal when it comes to suicide. And by how stabbing. common is it? It's to not kill common. yourself. It's not common. Okay. Yeah. On their way to Ames, Delhi, she kept reiterating, Suheb, mujhe bacha lo. Suheb, save me. The reporting medic at Ames, Dr. Lalwani, inspected Anju. His report said, quote, Patient brought dead with stab injury in abdomen, 12-26 hours. Anju Ilyasi died in the wee hours of January 11th. That day, Suheb Ilyasi's life changed forever. He found himself at the centre of a decade-long investigation. Within hours, apartment B13 was flocked by police officers and a team from the Forensic Science Laboratory, as well as the Central Bureau of Investigation, the CBI. 
the question was simple. On the night of January 10th, between 10.30 and 11.30 p.m., what had gone down behind the closed doors as Constable Shatrugan hopelessly awaited his bedding and his blanket? The answer to that simple question wasn't so simple after all. But before we dive into the investigation that captured the imagination of millions of Indians, let's rewind back to the life of the man whose crime show too captured the imagination of millions. In November of 1989, two mass communication students at Jamia Millia Islamia University happened to cross paths. This was Suheb Ilyasi and Anju Singh. Suheb was the son of Jamil Ilyasi, founder of All India Organization of Imams and a reputable religious scholar. Anju was also the daughter of a scholar, R.K. Singh, who served as the head of the metallurgy department at the same university, Jamia Islamia. Both kids were smart, both were good-looking, and both were maddeningly in love with each other. When Anju moved to London to pursue further studies, Suheb tagged along following his lover's suit. They got an apartment in London and moved in together. Initially, the families didn't approve of this relationship, but as they saw the affection the two shared for each other, eventually the couple had their blessings. And so, on 18th November 1993, the blessings were actualized and a civil marriage was officiated. Suheb and Anju, deciding they didn't want anything over the top, went for a court marriage. They lived in London for another year, but decided to move back to New Delhi in 1994. Initially, they moved in with Suheb's parents at the big city residence on Kasturba Gandhi Marg. The couple had to figure out how to land on their own two feet financially. Yes, they were from good families, but most young people yearn for independence, financial or otherwise. This couple needed to build something together to sustain themselves. And not just themselves, but the latest addition to their family, a baby girl. Alia Ilyasi was born in 1995. As mass communication students, the two had an eye for trends in television. While in UK, they observed the growth of a TV show called Crime Stoppers, they felt they could successfully emulate the same model in India. So they created pilot episodes to pitch to companies, but were rejected time and time again. Crime shows just weren't a thing in India. In fact, the initial pilot episodes were hosted by Anju and not Suheb. But the couple's persistence paid off. Their show was greenlit for production by ZTV in 1998, except this time Suheb was set to host the show. And right from the get-go, the show India's Most Wanted was a hit. It took the country by storm, serving the nation's true crime appetite in a manner that was both professional and investigative. This twice-weekly show had Indians glued to their screens, so much so that the unsolved cases Suheb covered became subjects of public inquiry after the episodes aired. On several occasions, criminals Suheb covered were reported cited by citizens. In one episode, Suheb covered the murder of a sex worker in Karol Bagh and within 10 minutes of the episode broadcast, the murderer was reported to the police. Same with UP's infamous gangster Shri Prakash Shukla, who was encountered and killed by the police within 15 days of the episode airing. The success of the show was palpable. Fame and money flowed in droves into the Ilyasi household. But this professional success masked the personal turbulence. He sounds like he was living every like current true crime podcaster's dream. I know I started the episode by saying he yeah. was also living the nightmare. So I'm sure we're getting to that. Mm-hmm. But to actually be able to tangibly affect Change. the pursuit of justice yeah. is what is, you know, it's he, kind of the aim. Should I? So Habe's the OG true crime podcaster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I kind of don't like him because I kind of feel like he's the killer. But also, yeah. But also really like cool. great at covering killers. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah. But like I said, this professional accomplishment came at a personal cost. You see, Suheb and Anju's marriage had been tumultuous for years now. Multiple times, the couple lived separately to take time off, even considering divorce. For example, in 1995, Anju moved back to London for six months to live with her brother Prashant. She told him she wanted a divorce, but Prashant helped reconcile the difference between his sister and brother-in-law. For what it's worth, Prashant was fond of Suheb and described him as the ideal brother-in-law. Anju again in 1998 moved to Canada to her sister Rashmi's place. This time though, she took Alia with her, something that did not sit right with Suheb. But to make amends, he visited Canada, rented an apartment nearby and repatched things with Anju. Finally, in 1999, daughter and mother moved back to Delhi. It seemed to have temporarily healed wounds. 
but wounds have a tendency to flare up. Anju's own brother and acquaintances describe her as short-tempered and impulsive. No doubt she was smart and accomplished, but she had a short temperament that exacerbated disagreements between the couple into extreme fights. That's what Suheb worried about on January 10th, 2000 when he was on his way home. All sorts of questions went through his mind. Why did she tell my secretary Z1 and I lost? Why did she tell my typist about the revolver being at home? Why did she send my daughter to my office late in the night? And he soon found out why. When he entered his home, Anju confronted him. She alleged, quote, he was more interested in spending time with Z than with her, end quote. As the argument was unfolding in house B13, the doorbell rang. It was the barbers that had come per Suheb's request. He urged her to postpone this argument until after the haircut. As he sat down under the barber's razor, Anju reappeared from their daughter's bedroom, demanding to have a conversation with Suheb then and there. Fazlu recounts that Anju and Suheb withdrew into their bedroom. He could hear them talk in English but not make out what they were saying. After 2 minutes, Suheb emerged and dismissed his barbers telling them to come to the studio directly. The two, although confused, left the Elias's home. Several witness testimonies corroborate the structure of events. It is at this point in the reconstruction of the events of 10th January that the water become murky and contentious. According to Suheb, once the barbers leave, he goes back into their daughter's bedroom to resume the heated conversation with his wife. Except this time, he finds a gun holster lying on the bed. The problem is, there is no gun in it. He anxiously asks Anju its whereabouts. Where is the revolver, Anju? Like cards in a deck, she reveals it. It was in her hands. Anju was armed. To make matters worse, she begins asking weird questions. She incessantly and angrily asks Suheb whether he would take care of their daughter Alia if anything were to happen to her. Meanwhile, Suheb is begging Anju to drop the revolver. Anybody at this point would be fearing their loved one is being suicidal, and so was Suheb. Suddenly, Anju picks up the cordless telephone lying nearby and dials her older sister Rita Van Eck, who is settled in America. It was lunch time in New Jersey when Rita received a call beginning with a plus nine one extension code. She knew it was her little sister. She must have wondered if it's probably too late in India to be calling at this hour, not expecting to hear what was to follow. She hears a voice murmur, "May I speak with Miss Rashmi Singh?" Rita was caught off guard by her sister asking to speak to her so formally. Before she got a chance to interject and say, "Are Bullu?" Anju tossed the phone to Suheb and he reflexively caught it. "Suheb, what happened?" the sister asked. "Quote, she is annoyed. We have gotten into an argument and look Bullu has taken my revolver and she is threatening me with suicide. Didi, Bullu ka to dimag kharab ho gaya hai. She has gone mad." You see everyone endearingly called Anju Bullu, but presently there is nothing endearing about Bullu's behavior. With a child at home, flailing a firearm is dangerous, and Suheb knew this. One incorrect move, one trigger movement, all it required was one mistake. Suheb told Rita that her sister is waving a gun and needs to calm down. Worried, Rita asks to talk to Anju, but Anju refuses. She is in no mood to be calmed. Rita tells Suheb to wait as she dials their other sister, Rashmi, who lives in Canada. While all this is going on, Anju again asks Suheb whether he take care of Alia. Suheb said, "Yes, I'll take care of our daughter." But the more Suheb said yes, the less Anju believed him. She insisted that he's not taking her seriously. Both were really riled up and agitated at this point. In frustration, Suheb told his wife to shoot him before she shoots herself. Obviously, he meant it rhetorically, but he felt this comment instigated her to turn the gun on herself. As she was about to shoot herself, he hurriedly grabbed her, wrestled the gun out of her hand, and freed it. He haphazardly unloaded the gun and threw it under the bed. Finally, the couple could resume a normal couple fight, one that doesn't involve arms. A frustrated and tired Suheb then collected all the bullets that are scattered on the floor and proceeded to dispose of them under the bed as well. With the gun taken care of, he breathed a sigh of relief. 
but by this point word must have got around in the singh side of the family that something is awry in house number b13 so suheb gets a call from kp singh anju's dad the metallurgy professor anju's dad is aware of the problems in their marriage and his daughter's short tempered nature and for what it's worth he trusts his son in law suheb Of the Singh family, the only person presently living in India was K. P. Singh, and in fact, he was living in Delhi at the UNESCO apartments, which was near to Mayur Vihar. His daughters called him because, owing to his proximity, he could go to the Ilyasi household to check in on them. So Heb is relieved to hear his father-in-law's voice, tells him Anju is not doing well, and begs him to come home as soon as possible. What a night it had been! What a turn it had taken! Little did Suheb know this wasn't the end of it. Hell, this wasn't even the beginning. As he sat beside his 5-year-old daughter on her bed assuming the worst was behind him, Anju appeared in the doorway with something in her hand. To Suheb's relief, it wasn't a gun. But the relief disappeared instantly when he realized Anju Ilyasi had a knife in her hand. Before he could say or do anything, Anju stabbed herself twice in the abdomen. So Heb flung himself at his wife, but it was too late. A deep incision perforating critical organs had been made. Blood gushed everywhere. So Heb cried, begged, apologized. Ye tumne kya kar liya? What have you done, Anju? This was So Heb's recollection of what happened in house number B13 on January 10th between 10:30 p.m. and 11:30 p.m. Okay. <laughs> So I know I started off with a set of preconceived notions <coughs> as you often do as I often do <coughs> but this is a lot of witnesses mm. all of whom are if anything should be closer to Anju, Anju exactly. than they are to Soheb mm. so why they would have a reason to lie about this right. recollection of events although I don't know if they agree with this yeah, recollection yeah, yeah. but basically if this is Soheb's story there are possibly and should be a lot of people to corroborate this evidence for sure and we'll get to all of it This is what Suheb told the police just a few hours after his wife died seemingly by suicide. He was in fact at UNESCO apartments with his father-in-law when his statement was taken. Suheb was so accustomed to reading police statements for a living, but giving one himself was so foreign. He cried endlessly and so did KP Singh and his granddaughter Alia. A wife, a daughter, a mother was no more. and the investigators at the scene of the crime had to figure out why why did anju ilyasi die if it was suicide then why did she kill herself and if it was murder why did her murderer kill her this was a high profile investigation within hours a panel of reputed doctors was set up for a post mortem dr r k sharma of aims dr alexander khaka of saftarjung hospital and dr lc gupta of aruna asif government hospital were called on 12th jan a day after anju's death to review her corpse the doctors carefully analyzed her wounds two incisions in the abdominal region There was no doubt she died because of those wounds. The question was whether they were self-inflicted wounds or perpetrated by someone else. The autopsy was going to prove to be a centerpiece of this investigation. The doctors knew this and so they left nothing to chance. They deemed the body insufficient and asked to be taken to the scene of the crime, source a fingerprint analysis of the knife and know whether Anju was left-handed or right-handed. After careful analysis of all facts at their disposal, a week later on 18th January, the panel published its findings. The injury number 1 was 15.5 cm deep from the external injury to the point of injury in the aorta. The cut on the aorta was obliquely placed on the left anterior lateral wall. The distance of the aorta from the anterior abdominal wall was 10 cm and the aorta was usually placed but most importantly the report stated quote the injury number 1 and 2 are self inflicted and suicidal in nature end quote now the doctors had done their work the police had to do theirs taking statements finding witnesses and collecting evidence constable shatrugan kp singh rashmi reena and a vast slew of witnesses and stakeholders were interviewed According to police documents, quote, Mrs. Rukma Singh, the mother of the deceased, stated on 13th January 2000 that her daughter never faced any trouble in her in-laws' home, 
but was short-tempered. She did not allege any foul play in the death of her daughter and she also conveyed to the subdivisional magistrate that she thought that the deceased had committed suicide by stabbing herself with the knife. End quote. So Anju's own mother dismissed any aspersions cast on Suhaib and testified to the likelihood of suicide. In fact, the SDM, the subdivisional magistrate, in his report noted that none of the fingerprint evidence from the knife nor the viscera analysis pointed towards Suhaib. Great, all set, good to go. Suhaib could now breathe a sigh of relief, you think. No one thinks he has murdered his own wife. And more importantly, the man can now mourn his wife's death, which has jolted the Ilyasi family. But the next decade of Suhaib's life weren't remotely going to be simple or straightforward. It is early in the morning of 28th March 2000, two months since Anju has died. Suhaib is asleep with his daughter when suddenly the bell rings and someone can be heard thudding the door. A groggy Suhaib goes to open the door only to hear the dreaded voice of a police officer read out your charge sheet. Quote, you are being arrested under sections 498A, 304B and 201 of the Indian Penal Code. Suhaib had been reported by someone for cruelty and torture to his wife under the provisions of dowry death. Dowry is an archaic practice where the bride's side has to pay the groom's family unreasonable amounts of money and other gifts in return for his hand in marriage. To protect women from the social evil, the legal provisions against dowry listed in section 498A offer a lot of immunity to women and demand immediate arrest of the man whether or not they are proven guilty. If a wife or a family complain of dowry harassment, the groom and his family are automatically arrested. This law was changed by India's Supreme Court in 2014 because it was widely misused for extortion. But Suhaib didn't have the luxury of the amended law. He was immediately arrested and put behind bars. But who the hell filed an FIR against Suhaib? Just a month ago, everyone from Anju's side was on his side. and she told her, Didi mujhe facts Every one of the Singhs had given a positive testimony in his favour. Then who suddenly changed their mind and why? In February, Rashmi Singh, Anju's sister, had flown back to India from the US to conduct her sister's last rites and spend time with her family in this hour of mourning. Although in January she had absolved Suhaib of any wrongdoing, in March she sent a letter to the police indicating the exact opposite. In her typed statement dated 16th March 2000, Rashmi accuses Suhaib of torture, both mental and financial against Anju, an extramarital affair, cruelty against his wife, threat to cause sister harm and demanding a dowry. In fact, the mother also went back on her initial testimony and supported her daughter's latest claim. The same mother who had one month ago accepted that her daughter killed herself was now alleging wrongdoing on Suhaib's part. But why did this change of heart happen? Well, Rashmi claimed she had evidence that Suhaib had committed passport forgery, bank forgery, credit card forgery and academic qualifications forgery which was exclusively known to Anju. In the 31-page statement made by Rashmi, she reveals that her sister Anju wanted to quote, get rid of all the cheating by leaving Suhaib and going to Canada on 3rd February 2000. According to Rashmi, this was the motive for Suhaib to kill Anju so that his forgeries could never be made public. End quote. All right, Aran, so these are like incredibly serious allegations yeah. that the family is now all of a sudden making. Mm -hmm. And I can make the assumption that maybe the dad and the mom didn't know that all of this was going on sure, in the marriage. Sure. It was just the sister who knew. And the sister came forward, which yeah. is why the mom has now come and like supported the sister. Mm -hmm. But why would the sister not talk about this sooner? I assure you, I mean, you're not alone in thinking this, right? I mean, these mm -hmm. are very serious claims. Yeah. Uh, it's not just dowry. Dowry is one of them. It's forgeries and it's yeah. passport fraud. Yeah. And the investigators wondered the same. Uh, they wondered that if this was a loving relationship, the family said good things about Suhaib. Yeah. It was a love marriage. It wasn't an arranged marriage, which is what is typical for dowries, is for it to be an arranged marriage. Right. This was a love marriage against the family's approval because, mind you, it was an interfaith marriage. 
does this dowry claim make sense are they exploiting this for something else or is this rashmi singh using it to extort him hmm. this is what the investigators tried to understand interesting i think my only reason that i can come up with because of which rashmi wouldn't come forth sooner with these details hmm. is that in india there's sort of an attitude that you know ghar ghar ki baat hai this sure, is yeah. a matter between a man and a yeah, woman yeah. even if it's something to the effect of like a lot of times physical abuse people don't feel okay intervening or calling the mm. cops or making claims to the police because they're like okay this is an internal matter which mm. will be solved that's the only thing i can think of but i'll give you the second reason in just a second but ashwara's point is right appearances can be deceiving what if all this was a facade by suhaib and in reality he was actually thirsty for money despite making riches from the show india's most wanted well If that was the case, I don't think Anju's own father and brother would go against their own wife and sister's testimony. Yes, R K Singh and Prashant Singh outright rejected Rashmi's claim, which if you think is very rare, the in-laws supporting each other rather than their blood family. When Suhey was in jail, Prashant gave a testimony to the police which illuminates what might be happening. Quote It is correct that after the death of my sister Anju myself my father and mother made a statement before the subdivisional magistrate it is correct that we all in our statement had stated that there was no foul play and that Anju was not harassed for demands of dowry by the accused it is correct that my sister Rashmi came from Canada and wanted the custody of Alia daughter of Anju It is correct that Rashmi was adamant to take the child with her to Canada and when the entire deliberations failed it resulted into the complaints and registration of the FIR against Suhaib to my knowledge he has never demanded dowry from any of our family member that is from me my mother and my sister Rashmi end quote It's crazy that all of this could possibly be for the custody of her niece yeah to take away Suhaib's someone else's daughter, child somebody else's child because, right yeah yeah to think that's a possibility is scary. it's unbelievable but then mm-hmm. why would your own father and brother go against you yeah. like yeah yeah doesn't add up and it wasn't just prashant even dr kp singh anju's own father in his statement asserted that his daughter quote was intelligent but many a time she used to lose temper and fight with the accused she was temperamental and in hot headedness she could do anything End quote. This is precisely the stance Suhaib and his lawyers took as well. Suhaib alleges that Rashmi said she would take Alia to US by hook or by crook, and it seems like the hook or the crook approach was working for Rashmi, but not for too long because her own brother and father gave opposing testimony. She and her legal team had to pivot. so they began demanding a second postmortem analysis by the panel she provided the investigators with anju's diaries that allegedly documented suhaib's fraudulent activities as well as a poor married life rashmi wanted the doctors to reanalyze the autopsy based on new circumstantial evidence as well as new fingerprint evidence and the court granted this reassessment two of the three doctors maintained their initial stance that these were clearly self-inflicted wounds The rational was that the shallow cuts was what in medical literature is called a hesitational cut. This is common in suicides by stabbing where the victim initially underestimates the force required to puncture the skin. So let's take Anju's example. She is not a seasoned killer. She brings the knife out, stabs herself, but with not enough force to cause real damage. This causes a hesitational cut. However, the next time she swings the knife, she recalibrates the strength required and this deep cut is what's the fatal cut. the doctors from aims and safdarjung hospital gave this reason ara so this is an interesting point about the depth of the cut actually right, right. telling us something about who the perpetrator of the mm. wounds was this is something that i've read though that uh, the nature of the wounds or the nature of a crime scene also tell you whether or not the killer or the perpetrator knew mm. the victim intimately interesting and so if for example a naked body is covered up mm. with a cloth it uh, shows that the perpetrator knew the you. victim because they felt a sense of shame mm. for the victim could a shallow cut indicate that as well so The question boils down to two things. Hmm. One is identifying which cut was the first cut. Now, sure, if yeah. the first cut was the shallow cut, yeah. it is what in medical literature is a hesitational cut. Hmm. But if the first cut was the deep one hmm. and the second cut was the shallow one, that hmm. could indicate exactly what you said hmm. where 
the the murderer did their job hmm. and in coming out perhaps hmm. nicked and caused the second cut hmm. or perhaps didn't got confused right so it was in determining which cut what hmm. was the chronology of the cuts mm-hmm. and that is what the third doctor in his reanalysis hmm. said i actually don't know which cut took place first oh, wow. another detail that stands out is that there was no hole in anju's shirt that she was wearing that day oh now that again lends itself probabilistically to a suicide usually when somebody stabs themselves they have their shirt lifted up as they are doing it mm. you think a murderer wouldn't first lift up lift the shirt, shirt and then up, yeah. they just go for it but there was no hole in uh, anju's clothes there was blood but there was no hole so hmm. that might also lend itself to the possibility of a suicide. suicide you see the third doctor lc gupta changed his stance in his opinion he couldn't confidently say this was a self inflicted injury and that there was a possibility that the injuries were a result of homicide of murder according to him for starters the abdomen is generally not an area one stabs themselves moreover since anju was right handed the injuries didn't make much sense to him and could be better explained by a perpetrator coming from behind his finding was quote that the theory of homicide cannot be ruled out in this case with definitive wordings in my view of new facts emerging and submitted it can be said that the patterns of injury are not decidedly self inflicted or suicidal end quote to sum it up he said there is room for doubt but room for doubt by no means means the plausibility or probability of murder but that's not how rashmi and her lawyers viewed it remember the initial sections of the indian penal code suhaib had been booked under were all to do with abatement to suicide through torture and dowry harassment their own claims didn't even mention murder but now that one of the panel doctors didn't rule out homicide Rashmi and Rita doubled down on the possibility that their sister Anju didn't stab herself but instead was stabbed by Suhaib. Now I'd like to treat this claim as it is on its own merit not on the credibility of the sisters but it is worth mentioning that once they fixated on the murder theory which falls under section 302 of the Indian Penal Code they ditched the dowry claim. In fact, all the courts rejected the dowry allegation because Rashmi was unable to present any real evidence that showed dowry was ever a thing that arose in the relationship. But now that Suhaib had dowry off of his shoulders, he had an even bigger burden that had replaced it: the death of his own wife. The legal battle continued for years. Suhaib had interim bail and restarted his life with some semblance of structure but unfortunately by this point he had lost his own show someone else began hosting India's most wanted Suhaib tried to emulate a similarly formatted show for Doordarshan but that flopped professionally and personally everything seemed in tatters but perhaps what was a ray of hope through all of this was his loving daughter Alia Contrary to Rashmi's desire to take Alia to the US, the young girl loved her dad and wanted to stay with him. Although she was very young when her mother died, she fervently believed in her father's innocence and wanted to see him free and relieved. But Suhaib's success professionally wasn't a fluke. He knew how to do great journalism. Now that he had been in prison and been tossed around in the judicial system, he came out invigorated, ready to build new projects. And if in 2000 he was all over the news for the investigation of his wife's murder, in 2005 he was again all over the news, but this time for an investigation he conducted. In 2005, Suhaib orchestrated a very controversial sting operation on Bollywood's beloved Shakti Kapoor and Aman Verma. In this while, Suhaib also made his directorial debut, a movie called 498A: The Wedding Gift. The plot was inspired by his friend's life apparently. Quote, "My film is inspired by my friend Saeed Maktoum, who committed suicide in 2009 because his wife made false allegations against him claiming that he had demanded dowry." End quote. One can't help but think the movie also had a lot to do with his own life and his own battle against the allegation levied on him. But while there was an uptick in his professional life, Suhaib was still at the mercy of the Karkaduma Trial Court in Delhi. Rashmi and Rita were adamant to prove their sister was murdered and they had evidence in their favor now for starters there is a little circumstantial evidence incriminating him 
Why did Suhaib lie to the doctor that first examined Anju? Why did he tell him that she ate something and something sharp hurt her? He very well knew she hadn't eaten anything weird and why obfuscate what the sharp object was? It was a knife and he very well knew it. Additionally, on the way to Ames, Anju kept saying, Save me, Suhaib, save me. Why would someone who wants to kill themselves want to be saved? This is the line of argumentation the prosecution took. When it came to hard evidence though, they didn't have much other than Dr. Gupta's dissenting opinion. So in 2011, a decade after Anju died, Rashmi demanded a new post-mortem to occur, led by a five-doctor panel. After 11 years, a post-mortem without the actual corpse is impossible. This request was a tad ridiculous, especially because there was nothing wrong with the initial three-panel report. Suhaib's lawyers pointed out the absurdity and stated precedents of how a new or de novo autopsy cannot be baselessly initiated. But the case takes an unexpected turn here. The judge of the Sessions Court presiding over this case allowed a new post-mortem. This was unprecedented and Suhaib's lawyers were caught off guard. Frankly, it doesn't make much sense to me either. Because when the new post-mortem was conducted, there was no physical body to analyse. Only pictures, videos, clothes and Dr. Gupta's dissenting opinion. Whatever the result of such a post-mortem is, how can it be more valuable than the original post-mortem that was conducted within hours of Anju's death? I don't know the answer, but the judge allowed it. And lo and behold, to everyone's shock, the Five Doctor panel published a new report on 9th October 2014. Quote, the board is of the unanimous opinion that the preponderance of evidence submitted in this case points towards commission of homicide. End quote. Crime show ke script se sansani machane wale Suhaib Ilyasi ke sabse sangeen jurm ka aaj hisab hoga. And some breaking news coming in. TV serial producer Suhaib Ilyasi has been convicted by the Delhi court in the case of his wife's death, Anju Ilyasi. Uh, Suhaib Ilyasi now has been convicted by the Delhi court in the case of his wife's death, Anju Ilyasi. In fact, uh, after his wife, Anju, died in 2000, Ilyasi was charged under Section 304B of the Indian Penal Code per dowry. In the India's most wanted show, se, ghar ghar mein mashoor hue, Suhaib ne apni hi patni ke murder ki aisi kahani rachi, jisne har kisi ko hairat mein dal diya. Suhaib Ilyasi murdered his wife, Anju Ilyasi. With this newfound report at the prosecution's disposal, they breezed through the proceedings. On 20th December 2017, the judge struck his gavel and delivered his judgment. Suhaib was found guilty of the murder of Anju Singh and sentenced to life imprisonment. The media world was shell-shocked. The man that covered killers for a living was a stone-cold killer himself. The prevailing opinion was that Suhaib had covered crime for so long that his expertise enabled him to almost commit the perfect murder, almost get away scratchless from homicide. But in the end, justice prevailed. Alia was heartbroken to see her dad shoved by the cops behind bars. The sisters rejoiced whatever modicum of justice they felt was delivered. But Suhaib didn't give up. In his heart, he knew he was innocent. He knew the order was botched, that the second post-mortem was a charade. And so in 2018, they moved their case to the Delhi High Court. It is worth reading the entirety of the verdict published by Honourable Judge Sri Murlidhar, who presided over the case along with Judge Vinod Goyal on the bench. After reviewing the hard facts of the case and the proceedings that occurred over the last 18 long years and all the witness testimonies, they had made up their minds. A large part of their new verdict relied on the competency of the second post-mortem. Turns out, this post-mortem was an absolute joke. When the doctors from this panel of five were cross-examined, they were asked a very simple set of questions. Since they didn't have access to Anju's actual corpse, the judges asked whether the doctors had seen the pictures and videos from the original autopsy, whether they had read the original autopsy, whether they had read the original police report, and whether they had read the dissenting opinion of Dr. L.C. Gupta. The doctors on this panel said, actually, no, we haven't. 
the judges were dumbfounded. How the hell did you come to a unanimous decision of homicide without even glancing at any evidence? Is it a joke? The doctors had nothing to say for themselves. The judges of the High Court also pointed out the unethical nature of imposing Section 304 for dowry and then not following through on it. This seemed like an opportunistic lawsuit where the goalposts of accusations kept moving as evidence kept being dismissed. On 5th October 2018, the court delivered its opinion on Suhail El Yassi versus the state. Quote, the prosecution, in order to succeed on a criminal charge, cannot afford to lodge its case in the realm of may be true, but has to essentially elevate it to the grade of must be true. In a criminal prosecution, the court has a duty to ensure that mere conjectures or suspicion do not take the place of legal proof and in a situation where a reasonable doubt is entertained in the backdrop of evidence available to prevent miscarriage of justice, benefit of doubt is to be extended to the accused. For all the aforementioned reasons, the court holds that the prosecution has failed to prove the guilt of the appellant for the offence under Section 302 of the IPC. I can't process it. I'm really happy. Um, all this time, all this while, I've been silent. My family has been silent. We haven't put out any public statement or anything like that. Only for this judgment to be our voice. We, only, we, we were only silent so that this judgment could be our voice. And we had full faith in the judiciary. We have suffered a lot. My entire family, my little brother, my mother, we, we've all suffered a lot. All of that is well and good, Aryan. The one thing that I do not understand mm. is that why would Anju kill herself? Mm. That's also true for why would Soheb kill Anju. True. I don't see any motive on any side of this case. Mm -hmm. Yes, they had kind of a tumultuous marriage. Yeah. But for the most part of it, it still seemed like they cared for each other. Mm. They had a daughter that they had to take care of. They were financially well off. If Anju wanted, she had the mm. ability to move to the US or Canada like she had done in the past. Mm. She had parents that seemed to love her. I just don't understand... Mm. What what is the motive of anything that has I, gone on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the motive seems so off. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think happened. Mm -hmm. Imagine your parent, your father, and your brother calling you hot headed and impulsive in public. Mm -hmm. Those to me are euphemisms for crazy. You know? Yeah. Like they're sure. trying to say yeah. she's a little off the charts like hmm. she is erratic so I perhaps maniacal perhaps this was a mental health episode that resulted in something I yeah. don't know I'm not a psychiatrist hmm. but when your own family uses those very strong words in public in public the situation's I, worse probably the situation's worse in real life yeah so hey Belyasi host of India's most wanted was no longer a wanted man after 18 years the stain of his wife's death was cleaned who knows whether Anju's sisters truly believed their sister was murdered or were selfishly framing Suhaib to get custody of his daughter. Either way, they're not going to be held accountable for putting Suhaib and his daughter through the churner of judiciary for 18 years. 18 years with Suhaib could have done so much more and spent so much more time with his daughter, told so many more stories of crime. But until we tell you our next story, stay safe, stay crazy and stay desi. If you like what we do here at Desi Studios and absolutely love what we're wearing today, this is merch you can go buy all for yourself. You can buy this Desi Crime merch in our YouTube store on the link down below at Karak Merch. Keep the engines at Desi Studios rolling so we can pay our videographer right behind the camera to make these amazing episodes just for you.